You're listening to Nightmare on Film Street. The current time is 666. Traffic is clear ahead from here to the afterlife. But it's hell outside. For the next hour, you're on Nightmare Time. So, let's give a grave welcome to our hosts, John and Kim. Hello again, fiends, and welcome back to Nightmare on Film Street, the horror movie podcast for the casually obsessed. I'm John. I'm Kim. And we're once again wearing our sunglasses at night. We're talking about vampire movies. We're closing out our sunglasses at night double bill with Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark. Last week we talked about Blade, which is a fucking banger. <laughs> which we're still high <laughs> on. Oh, fuck, that movie's good. <laughs> this, this week we're continuing on with another modern interpretation of vampires. You know, for the time when this came out in 1987, something we hadn't really seen with vampires before. They Dust. were Yes, <laughs> they were just starting to make their comeback too, right? This is the same summer that gave us the Lost Boys. Fright Night is recently... Vampires were cool right? again. Oh, vampires were back. It's funny. We've been doing this podcast for a while now. We're getting up there in age. We're getting long in the podcast tooth. And long in the we, vampire tooth. <laughs> <laughs> and we have not done Near Dark previously, despite a lot of people wanting us to talk about it. This is like one of those big gems that I don't think a, a lot of people who aren't big horror fans see, mm. but it's definitely one of the top recommended among the community. Oh, yeah. And I always kind of avoided getting into the near dark talk because, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose some people right about now. Oh, no. <laughs> I was never really big on this movie. Yeah. I, I, uh, You're talking past uh, tense, though. Uh, That's interesting. I never okay. really, yeah, well, we're going to get into it because we watched it and we're going to talk about it. But Are you cliffhangering me here saying that maybe your opinion has changed a maybe. little bit? Maybe. You'll have to tune in <laughs> to find out. But I'm just saying I was very hesitant to, re- one, rewatch this movie, and especially after seeing Blade yeah. and how bombastic it was and just how fist pump in the air energy we had for it. I was like, oh, fuck, the next episode's going to suck. Because, like, I just remember being like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I like my vampires when they're all, like, rich and fancy. I'm very, you know, like, they either need to have, like, guns and pleather or they need to be arist- ar- aristocratic. Huh. But and, you're also, uh, these vampires are not any of those. <laughs> you're also a girl who likes the Devil's Rejects, so I'm just like, yeah, you got, and, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, you understand dirt and sweat. So <laughs> yeah. I think this was the perfect time for me to rewatch oh, this movie. Oh, thank God. <laughs> so I'm, this is how I'm treating it. You know when you were, like, 12 years old and your weird uncle was like, try some of my beer. What? And, and, you, and you had a sip of beer and you were just like, no, I don't like this and I'm never going to drink this ever again. Oh, okay. And it was just. Your taste buds weren't ready for it. Like, you hadn't hit puberty yet. You didn't have beer taste buds. Uh. And now when you drink beer, you're like, ah, refreshing. I love summer. That's how I feel about Near Dark. I think I just watched it when I was too young. I didn't have the dust gene yet. (laughs) I I didn't appreciate westerns. (laughs) The dust gene. (laughs) And now I can't get enough of fucking dust and and cowboy hats and horses and all that nonsense. Oh, this is great. I love me a swinging door. This could not have. This was a roller coaster ride that I didn't think I was going to get the intro of the episode. Damn. So, I'm just saying that sometimes you need to go 20 years <laughs> without watching a movie and then revisit it and you're like, oh, I'm a new person now. I like dusty movies. I'm hoping to one day get there with Hellraiser. But anyway, today <laughs> we are talking about Near Dark, a movie that, like you said, people have been wanting to hear us discuss. I think when everybody thinks about Near Dark and when everybody's like, ooh, you should talk about Near Dark, it's so cool. The one thing they're thinking about, the number one thing they're thinking about, which is what's going to lead Which our is definitely three good things. The logo for this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's on your phone right now if you're listening to it. It's Bill Paxton covered in blood wearing sunglasses at night. It's such an iconic image and it's the only thing really so there were t- there's two images I remembered from this movie. Yeah. Bill Paxton with sunglasses and a leather jacket in a yep. bar with a jukebox yep. and Smoke and headlights on a horizon with just a like a squad of hillbilly vampires. Yep, yep. And, you know, didn't disappoint. Was pretty much both those things. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Those are the two things I think about 
every single time I think about this movie. A good thing number two, we've alluded to it already, it's a Western. I think before it's a vampire movie, it's a Western. You know, in the way that... It, it, so much so that they I don't think they say vampire once in the whole movie. That's a good point. And I don't know if... Like, we would categorize this as a vampire movie, Absolutely. but I don't know if they're directly vampires. Like, I think they're definitely some form of humans that have vampiric traits, but the fact that, and we'll talk about this, that they can be unvampired very easily, maybe they're not vampires. I don't know if I call it very easily, but you I don't think... They're dead. Okay, well, well, we'll get into that soon. Good thing number three about Near Dark, before we get to the trailer, Kim wants me to say RV of Darkness. Because RVs the, are great! <laughs> because the, I love horror movies the, with the, RVs. The vampires them. run around in an RV. It's basically what they use as their coffin. But my actual good thing number three, which I've forgotten, <laughs> is that light is like a deadly weapon in this movie. And the way that Catherine Bigelow shoots light encroaching, like, you know, it's near dark, right? Like the way that she shoots light- Actually, it's near dawn. (laughs) In encroaching the vampire's presence is great. They are scared of it in a way that's more than just like, pull the drapes back, you know? Like there's a whole shootout where light is like piercing at them like daggers. Especially for such a Mad Maxian lifestyle that they live. Yeah. They live in cars with windows. Right, it's a great evolution from the classic Western through all of the grindhouse cinema that we saw in the 60s and 70s to bring us to the genre mashup of Catherine Bigelow's Near Dark. Caleb Colton no longer belongs to our world. We'll give him a week to see if we can call him one of us. He belongs to hers. But you have to learn to kill. He belongs to theirs. I don't want to kill. He makes a kill tonight. And they all belong to the night. It's three hours short for a bus ticket home. You help me out? What are you on? Believe me, I told you. Don't think of it as killing. Eat man. Eat man. Come on. Don't think at all. It's just something that you do night after night. It's only ever a question of time. Near dark. It'll be your boys falling in with checkout time. Ah! Hold yourself some time, son. Near dark. Pray ah! for daylight. has its price. Speaking of light moments, one that really kind of sold me on, you know, the the good thing you were selling yeah. is the moment when it's practically dawn and Lance Henriksen, Jesse, yes. He's trying to get them a hotel room like right. fucking right it's quick. So fucking good. And you watch the sun rise on the check-in desk and yeah. it's getting closer and closer and the concierge or i guess the owner of the hotel it's a motel there's not a concierge (laughs) he's still in his pajamas (laughs) the hotel owner hands over the key but his hand is in the sunlight yes and he's got to hide his hand to grab the key it's just a really great physical scene of of that fear that they have yeah and i really enjoyed it it makes me really wish that i could see this movie on the big screen on film i think you we you really got to watch this movie in high def you know like you got to watch it in the best presentation possible because if you're just watching like a vhs copy at home you're probably not going to see that detail it's not as apparent and i think it's the subtlety of what makes you're um, being a little snooty right now about this <laughs> dust movie john <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just saying that the West uh, has no place for your the, snoot. Yeah, if the if if you're watching this like 240p, it's just it's not going to resonate the same way. I think we got a snow here on the pod. I don't appreciate your sass. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Before we get too snooty, let's see what the real snoots think. Near Dark is currently sitting at a 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb, 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, despite being a bit of a box office flop. And 3.5 out of 5 on Letterboxd. Yeah, this movie didn't make back its budget. I can see that. (laughs) It just feels kind of niche. Like, it it makes sense that this was kind of like a mumble cult cult movie. Like, it Mm. it grew 
it was kind of, you know, word of mouth. You know, you have to see this movie, especially because there were so many more loud vampire movies at the time. Yeah. It would make sense that you would be like, oh, I, I love vampire renaissance. And then you search for more and this is what you find. I think you're right. I think they're definitely not selling the idea of it being a vampire movie. It really wasn't until you said it in the intro that it occurred to me that I don't think anybody uses the word vampire once. No. Which is crazy. I think I remember hearing that Catherine Bigelow and Eric Redd, the screenwriter, who also wrote The Hitcher. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It, like, right? When you think about it that way. Yeah. That, that movie's also got a great control of light. He's just really obsessed with like sunrise and sunset. But oh, you would be if you really like road trip movies. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They wanted to make a Western but there was no interest in Westerns, so they brought in... Like, what's hot now? What's trendy? Pretty much, right? Like, they were like, how do we rework this? Because, like, they still had, like, a good idea there. They probably just wanted to shoot in the fucking desert in the dust. I'm like, <laughs> I want a tumbleweed and I want a horse. That's all I need. And they had both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, though, because this... Maybe this just came out too soon. Because this was right before we got a bit of a Western boom. There was, like, a neo-Western revitalization that came. It's where we got like things what? like Silverado, oh. Unforgiven. <laughs> In, truly one of the, the one of the best Clint Eastwood roles ever. Like these are all like early '90s, late '80s movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we were at a time where like the vampires were were fanging out. But the, you don't even see a fang in this movie. I don't know if the vampires True. truly have fangs. Yeah, because they also love just slitting people's throats open, putting pint glasses underneath the slit, and just drinking what comes falling into the cup. Like they don't they have, have such a bandit, a, like a bandit sense about them. Yeah, and th- th- I think that's. What what really caught me the most about this because like I, I'm a so we, we were talking about you being a snoot I'm a snoot with my vampires mm. I really like a classy vampire and how they sold me or how I sold myself upon this watch how I was sold how you brainwashed yourself into liking <laughs> this movie how I spun this for me to like it <laughs> was that I w- they were like bandits who were constantly on the run yeah. and they go into towns and they like they rob a bank yes and they're they're constantly hiding out that's exactly Exactly it, right? Like these are all the tropes that you would get in a western. It's like instead of robbing the bank or or they're robbing the blood bank. Oh shit! Yeah, instead of like a big train heist, they just roll into a bar, massacre the place, and leave. Mm -hmm. And it's not as Tarantino-ish or maybe Rodriguez enough. You know, Robert Rodriguez. It doesn't take as much joy in it. Yeah, because like there's music, like the Cramps are playing on the jukebox while they're slaughtering people. It's the tentpole scene of the movie. And it's not like we're having fun with it. It's more like we're really uncomfortably watching a group of sadistic serial killers playing with their food. Yeah, it gets uncomfortable. After the first kill, every patron in that bar is aware they're going to die. Yeah. And we focus on like sweaty brows and nervousness being backed into a corner. And it's it really stews you there. Yeah, you definitely do not have any fun watching that scene with I mean, the apart exception from- <laughs> of Bill fucking Paxton. Asterisk. <laughs> yeah. God damn. He's the best in everything that he was in. It didn't matter what where he was, how big his role was. He was what you were talking about at the water cooler the next day. Yeah, it just makes me sad. But it it is wonderful every single time you watch a movie that has Bill Paxton in it because I'm always reminded how fun he is. He's a very serious actor and he had a lot of cred and respect. But he chooses roles where there's kind of a duality to it. It's a real part, but he gets to also be the leading man and the kooky character. Yes. Which is... Kind of an anomaly. Who can do that? Yeah. Yeah, he... Maybe Brad Pitt when he was a a little younger. Yeah, it's like George Clooney almost Matthew McConaughey-ish, but it's more only in rom-coms. Right? He was totally unique. He was like a Nicolas Cage meets a Brad Pitt or a Nicolas Cage meets a Matthew McConaughey because, yeah, he could have fun but he was totally serious and he was conventionally handsome yeah like he could be in blockbuster movies but then you also saw him in club dread and you're like what are you doing here (laughs) yeah man we got i love it but why are you here we got to do frailty sometime you know frailty actually would have worked really well with near dark doesn't that also have matthew mcconaughey in it that does have matthew mcconaughey (laughs) in it you're absolutely right yeah it's got powers booth with his big fucking voice as well and yeah like one of the directorial efforts of, of bill paxton god we miss him but He's the fucking best in this movie. Sort of going back to it maybe coming too soon with the Western thing. That really hurts a bit because it is really a perfect evolution 
of what Westerns had kind of become in a way. Mm -hmm. Because you've got your classic John Ford Western movies. Are you getting real deep in here? I'm not trying to get super deep, but I mean, the Westerns became the biker movie, you know? We we traded in the horses for motorcycles, and then Mm. the outlaws became the bandits, the the biker gang that was rolling into town. You know, that took on a little bit more of a hippie move with Easy Rider, and then I just love the idea of them being like, well, where else do we go with this? Like, what else could they be? Movies got a little more serious and a little more grounded in reality in the 70s but like by the time we get to the 80s it is like grindhouse era like horrors it was like the rise of the stunt man (laughs) yeah yeah so the idea of them going from from outlaw cowboys to bikers to kind of back to cowboys but they're fucking vampires just seems like such a natural evolution that they should still be getting slapped on the back for yeah, and also, too, this should be a whole subgenre. Like, Western vampires. We need more. Yeah. Constantly, we need more. We just need more cowboy horror. Vampires on general. trains. Like, just. Yeah. I'll, I'll take. Well, you know, I'll take any of it. You're, you're only saying vampires on trains because what you really want is like an Agatha Christie style murder mystery with vampires. Holy shit, yes, I do. Can you I imagine do. like a mustached Poirot oh. who's just like <laughs> sipping a little pint glass of like type O negative? <laughs> yeah, Love exactly. It. We, we Love see it. who has stuck the steak into his heart. <laughs> <laughs> on his 212th birthday. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good idea for a murder mystery. I've never grown up in Texas. We've spent a little bit of time in places like Texas. We We've live... driven through Texas a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, we, I guess we stayed there for a bit. Yeah, and <laughs> we live in uh, we live in a more rural spot in Canada. We now. live in the prairies, which yeah. is cold Texas. I, I just <laughs> I have my entire life loved just like crime in Texas, like rural crime. Yeah, obviously any horror movie set in Texas, anything set in Mexico, just like anywhere where there's a tumbleweed and a horse and it just kind of feels like life is passing by a little slowly. That's the kind of spot where it's unexpected to see something like a chainsaw massacre, you know? But then at the other, on the other hand, you're like, oh no, of course it would happen here. Like you live in the city, you're like, oh, it could only happen in a place like Texas. Yeah, and I think there's also a little bit of lawlessness to it because, you know, there's two cops per a 300 yeah. mile radius so it, it, it's more dangerous because you're alone in a vast space yeah and of course a group of serial killers could just float into town go on a rampage and then drift off into the night right? yeah and it's- if we're talking about the 80s like now we know that the, those different precincts were not speaking to each other oh, so yeah. <laughs> if you murdered somebody in texas and then went to arkansas you were scott clear <laughs> yeah it's nuts like the heyday of the serial killer has sort of come and gone Thank God. Uh, well, I mean, but yeah, thank God. But also, in for I mean us, movie, yeah. <laughs> who spends a lot of time at rest stops and truck stops, which are scary spots. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem, right? Like, they're. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit already, but like, because Caleb is our lead, he very clearly does not want to be a killer. He doesn't have it in him. As much as he loves this girl. He's a girl, lover, not a fighter. He's a lover, not a fighter. He's, he, like, he loves this girl, May, who he just- He loves. He doesn't know this girl, May. <laughs> he has fallen in love with May, and their relationship continues to grow as they spend time together. Now, he is kind of like almost symbiotically attached to her. They like, have a real mother-son relationship in a way that creeps me the fuck out. Okay, so let's talk about the dynamic of the group then, right? Like, obviously, Caleb is uh, super sweet and wholesome. And because he rejects the vampires entirely and he doesn't want to get in on their fun action. Yeah, he's definitely, you know, our youngest daughter's new boyfriend and we're inviting him to dinner and we're sussing him out. Yes, that that is the vibe in the group. And he has uh, not yet killed a person. He's spent about a week or two with them by the time we get to the middle of the movie. And they're kind of saying like, look, you either have to be part of us or you're dead. Like, we're going to kill you. We can't afford to just have you hanging around because you like this girl. You're either part of the pack or you're a pile of bones on the side of the road. Well, and you realize very quickly when he fucks up that it makes sense because they can't have a weak link. When he lets one of the guys go from the bar massacre, immediately the cops are at their door and they're in a shootout during broad daylight, which is so much more lethal than just a standard, you know, little gun down because every bullet hole pierces through their hotel room and 
it's a stream of sunlight that'll, that'll kill them. This is one of the best goddamn sequences of the entire movie. And yeah, like, because he's a, he, I don't want to say he's a little whip because he's a good guy. Like he's the person we're supposed to be rooting for. He doesn't want to kill people. And we're not supposed to be mad at him about that. We're supposed to be on his side here. You're like, we shouldn't be drinking people like they're Capri sons. Like <laughs> we should be teaching our sister how to put the horseshoes on. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We should be farmers in Texas <laughs> is what it comes down to. Now the shootout is great because like a classic Western move, of course they're bare barricaded in this little hovel somewhere and the laws come knocking on the door they're definitely outgunned but like obviously they don't get wounded by bullets what's really going to kill them is the sunlight and every single time a bullet goes flying through the the walls through a window it's just like this slit of light where it's deadly if they go anywhere near it so they've got no problem getting shot up the issue is that at some point they're going to run out of cover and they're going to burn to a crisp inside this room. Yeah, and it's very fast acting. Like They get baconed like right away. And yeah. it, there's some great special effects there too because they're little sparks of flames whenever they get in the sunlight and it's just brief little like blips it just looks so good there's a lot of great firework in the movie like they, they also blow up they a lot love of cars. fire <laughs> god damn i love fire <laughs> these are the most pyro vampires ever absolutely because like when when they get made they move to a new town they steal a new car they blow up the old one they try and destroy as much evidence as they can it also just serves it also looks cool that's the thing it looks cool and it serves the image of the movie because they always kind of walk around like shadows in the night like when we see them at the top of the hill that iconic image you were talking about at the beginning they are just outlined figures essentially ready to like turn into bats and fly down into town as much as they don't do that i don't think these are bat vampires they are not they are definitely not bat vampires yeah like they definitely can't turn into fog yeah Uh, maybe rats I, i no they i don't think they have transformation powers but it's the way the entire movie is shot that I think is really what makes it worth watching. I also think the story between Caleb and May and the rest of their group, it's missing a little something. I think it's because he's always like, I don't want to be part of this. Ooh, don't make me. It's basically him doing that for an hour and a half. Mm. He's got a little bit of trying to escape and get back to his family that's interesting like everybody thinks he's more of a junkie than a vampire i feel like the plot stuff about this movie is a little more on the fly like the how the film is you know nomadic the Mm. story feels a little Mm. nomadic he happens to meet her she happens to like him she happens to bite him you know the family has to pick him up because they either have to kill him or adopt him yeah and you know like there's that big bar sequence because they're hungry which is kind of a tentpole scene for the movie but really has no plot in it no but it's, uh, well it is but it's fantastic i'm not knocking that scene it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite moments of the movie and it's our sunglasses at night moment yes but then there's like a whole second plot that's so brief but i think is a more emotionally deep story than May and Caleb. It's Homer and... Oh my God, right? Is it Sarah, his yes. younger sister? Yes, so Homer is, is, is essentially... He, Homer's like, a total Claudia. <laughs> yes. He's like an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, maybe 11-year-old vampire who is the oldest of the entire group. Is he? I, I gather. I mean, his name is also Homer. That is a fucking old-ass vampire name. Yeah, I don't know. They talk about... They call him the old man. Yeah, I think he's yeah. the I think he's the oldest of the group. Huh. And he has turned May, who is Caleb's age. And like who the, I'm assuming he wanted as his partner and I she's so refused too. him. Yeah. Because he's a child. Yeah. Like regardless of the fact that he's maybe six hundred years old, like I think because of the name Homer, I like to pretend that he's like, from ancient Rome or something. Mm. And he has just sort of like, drifted along for centuries and sort of run into this group here. We know that Jesse, played by Lance Henriksen, fought for the South in the, the American Civil War. So I think he, outside of Homer, he's the oldest of the group. He's the leader. He's calling the shots. He's ruthless. But yeah, Homer is looking for somebody his age because it's it's this torture of an existence to be old, knowledgeable, world-traveled person mm-hmm. living in a child's body. Yeah, and like, it's creepy as fuck now, but in 300 years, you're going to be the only other person in the world that understands what I'm going through. Yeah, so he, he happens upon Caleb's sister, and he wants to turn her, so he's got a partner. And yeah, that could have been a much bigger part of the movie. Because uh, it just comes so late in the film. Yes, 
Yeah, and like he's been, you know, he's leaving nuggets throughout about how sad he is and how annoyed he is and how awful it is to be him. But it's kind of almost it's kind of just vampire energy though. Like <laughs> it's I feel a like vampires vampire are pretty blasé about everything. <laughs> also, shout out to that kid because he's also the little snotty brother in Teen Witch. He's like, I li- "You're a dog. <laughs> You're a dog." The whole movie that was us. <laughs> yeah. I, and I love that that's our point of reference. Like we're like that kid from from Teen Witch, not like that guy that went on to be a filmmaker and wrote the final girls yeah you know he has done a lot of other stuff it's joshua miller right is the name i think, I think so yeah i mean <laughs> he's still he's still out there rocking but like he's always gonna be the shitty little brother from teen witch for me honestly he was too good for that movie like and oh i fucking God. love that movie yeah he's amazing he steals every scene that he's in oh he's in so teen good when he's eating a whole fucking cake he's under her head cake. oh i love it <laughs> We're watching that later. <laughs> uh, it's a good choice. Yeah, the uh, the chaos at the end of the movie is like the group falling apart because Caleb is trying to defend his family. He still hasn't killed anybody. He keeps currying favor with the group because he's the guy who risked his life to go get the van so that way they could escape the shootout. So like he set himself on fire in order to save the group. Like He, he bought himself some time. He bought himself a little bit of time. And unfortunately, Jesse will not let him exist with them unless he is a killer. That's his barrier for entry here Mm -hmm. like he cannot trust him unless he's got some skin in the game and it comes to a head when they come across his family because they've all seen their faces they can't just let them go the family's got to go so at this point you got to choose it's either it's either them or us either you all die or you kill your family and join us it's interesting too that he doesn't give them the option of like we turn them all because clearly they're probably going to turn the little girl like, they're going to turn his sister. I see. I, we don't really have, like, this isn't a talking family. They don't talk about their emotions. They oh, don't okay. sit down, you know, have conversations around the table. The vampires di- the don't believe in table. therapy. <laughs> I don't know if Jesse and Diamondback are necessarily cool with Homer turning an eight-year-old girl. Yeah. But we don't have enough time to stop and see how that dynamic might have changed, which is why I, I wish we explored it more. Because that, that would have been a great opportunity to see more about their relationship because a lot of their relationship is just inferred like we're like oh they have a family dynamic like this is Mm -hmm. mom this is dad these are siblings it would be cool to see the breakdown of that because they they aren't actually family no they really aren't and there's there's these interesting little moments too with diamondback and jesse they are kind of may and caleb but they've just been they they've been killers for decades. Yeah, for, like for they're years. they're rocks on the sea. Like they've yeah. been rounded down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like they're reminiscing about old times while they're driving around. I love too when she's like, "Oh, isn't this where you pretended to have a flat tire? Like this is where you turned me." And he's kind of like telling her to forget about the past and not think about it. But there's also that moment where he's at the hotel where the shootout happens, and the old guy's like, "Hey, didn't you rent a room here?" Like. A long time ago? And he's like, yeah, I come through town about every 50 years or so. (laughs) The dynamic of the group is great. And I think all of the actors are fucking killing it. They are like such a solid unit. Mm -hmm. That's also why it's so hard for Caleb to sort of penetrate the group. Because there is like a defined dynamic. They've been a hunting party for decades, for forever, it seems. And... I like the terminology you're using here, like hunting party and stuff. Like, I'm really vibing. (laughs) Well, they are. They're like a wolf pack, Mm -hmm. right? And so, like, they're really not trying to allow outsiders in. But then they also have to deal with those human emotions that they clearly still have, like love. Yeah, definitely. Because they all recognize that love exists. I mean, except for maybe Severin. He doesn't have any moments where... No, that's why Bill Paxton's so great. Like, he's just a jackass. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, even Jesse and Diamondback can sympathize with May wanting a partner. Yeah, exactly. Like, Like, we all remember young love. (laughs) But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is you have to kill to survive. And if you don't, we will die. And guess what? They all fucking die. You know, every single one of them die. They were right. He is their end. (laughs) Yeah. Either he was going to join them or they were all going to go. There are so many good moments of the movie, but you're right. It's one of those, you know, the sum of the parts doesn't equal the whole or whatever. You know, like each individual piece of this movie, like I fucking love this scene and I love that scene and I love this dynamic and I love how tight the group are Mm -hmm. because all of these actors basically walked off aliens into this movie. Pretty much. Bill Paxton, Lance Henriksen, and Jeanette Goldstein, who plays Diamondback, they all came from aliens. Mm -hmm. James Cameron has a fucking cameo in the movie. He's in this movie? Yeah, there's like when they're walking down the street, you can see aliens is playing across the, on the field. 
Peter Marquis. And then I think somebody gives Bill Paxton the finger. That's James Cameron. Oh, funny. I didn't really notice it, but I've read it on the internet before. I, w- I was trying to look for it last night. I completely didn't see it. But uh, they are a they are a fucking core group. They are like bandits. They are like cowboys. They're a biker gang. And apparently there's a fun story that I heard uh, a couple years ago where they were trying to be that group. Like, not like method acting, but they were trying to spend some time together before they got on set. Mm-hmm. So that Get in the headspace. Yeah, exactly. Eat and at a diner and like not say thank you. Exactly. So <laughs> they, they took it a little further than that. They, they decided that they were going to go on a road trip to Wyatt Earp's grave. Because that just seemed like the thing to do. Like, he's the fucking like, outlaw badass mm. king. Like, they went to Dollywood, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, they just went to the dark-ass vampire version of Dollywood. And they would only travel at night. They're not living during the day. They're only living at night. They got pulled over by a cop at one point, And Lance Hendrickson and the entire group are in character. And they're being really standoffish with this fucking cop. Like, implying that they've got a gun. And, you know, like, you should go away. And at some point, the cop did reach for his gun. They're like, okay, nope, we're just joking around. We're all actors. Hey, don't you recognize us? We were in these movies. You want to take some photos? Like, they really jumped at a character. We're researching a role. <laughs> they, they, they pushed it as close to the line as they fucking could. Oh, fuck. Because they wanted to live that life. Dang. I do like how many vampires get burnt up by the sun in this movie, though. And we even get it first shot. Is I'm assuming it's the only thing that can kill a vampire in this universe. That's what it seems like, yeah. Because... You know, getting shot doesn't do it. Oh, when fucking Lance Henriksen uh, regurgitates that bullet. Oh my God. How did we? That should have been one of the good things. So good. Should have been one of the good things. Dad shoots him in the chest and he just spits the bullet in his hand and hands it. He, he puts it in his pocket. He puts it in his pocket. <laughs> Man, okay. Well, the only, other th- the only other thing other than the sun is explosions. Like you can get exploded into a hundred pieces. Oh, because, yeah. You can be exploded. <laughs> yeah, because Caleb tries to run Bill Paxton Severin over with a truck. But thankfully, he knows how to break a truck. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, we learned that about how to jackknife a truck and make the <laughs> truck explode that i think the truck driver in this movie i think he's one of the guys who escapes prison in the fugitive as well there's a lot like there's a lot of actors in this movie that have been in other shit they're just using james cameron's roll of decks <laughs> <laughs> pretty much but yeah bill paxton on top of that truck just like punching into the engine and ripping out gears and shit that's that's so great moment. that's like terror at forty thousand feet yeah. moment he's just on the side of the, the plane pulling out shit oh, I love it. <laughs> and the only thing left of him is his like razor sharp spurs <laughs> that he uses to slit people's throats i love that he does that oh my that's God. such a great method of like if you're a western vampire of course you're gonna slit a throat with your spur oh man I, I know we're kind of like winding to the end, so there is one sunglasses at night moment we haven't mentioned that oh. will really upset me if we don't take a second to appreciate it. What's that? And it's during one of your favorite scenes. It's during the sunlight shootout scene. Lance Henriksen's sunglasses oh, have a yeah. nose piece. <laughs> yeah, they all look like they're wearing sort of those like steampunky welding it's, glass it's goggles. It's so Mad Max. Because like, they can't see it in out into the sunlight, right? Yeah. I love the nose piece. It's just it's just a touch of silly that I really appreciate. That's the part of the evolution that I'd forgotten, right? We went from cowboys to bikers to Mad Max to the vampires in Near Dark. That's the full arc that we got. Damn. Yeah, no, I wish I wish I loved this movie more, but there are pieces of it that are so good and it it's shot so incredibly well. Like if you like nighttime photography, you got to check this shit out. Even just the way that like, traffic light is bouncing off the wet gravel road. It, it looks amazing. And yeah, the way that the lights crawling across the table in the motor in the uh, in the motel, the way that it's always just sort of like encroaching on everything that they do, like it really is a threat in this movie and I love how it looks. But yeah, I wish it was a little more vampire-y. Yeah, and and two, we're talking like the main story, the little love story that's that bookends this, you know, we're vampires in the dust. It's a real teenage romance. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> like, I was calling it Little Mermaid. <laughs> yes. She's like, but daddy, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be here longer than the stars. You don't know how bad it feels. Look at the darkness. Can't you feel it? And we're just like, oh. <laughs> I mean, if, if I was Caleb and I was like 17, 18, yeah, I would have I fallen for this vampire lady. I would have been so dead on the side of the like, whatever. what are you saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. And uh, that's that's how Kim hooked me, too. <laughs> so, like, overall, what's your rating of Near Dark? Because I'm thinking, like, I'm a, I'm a three out of four on this one. I'm a three out of four, too, but okay. I honestly did not think I was going to be before we watched what it. Is, okay, so going in, what did you think your you think, What was the rating you were worried you were going to deliver to the so listeners I was of the podcast? probably going to kindly give it a two out of four, but it, I thought it was going to be a lie. Yeah. The first time I watched this, I just didn't, 
I just didn't get it, I don't think. I didn't give it the chance that it deserved. And I was also not in a place that I appreciated these types of movies. Like, I wanted more. You wanted Underworld. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't you always? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think also because it's so... Uh, revered people are always talking about how great it is like oh like don't forget about near dark it's one of the best ones well and i also like to let people like things so i hate oh, sure. you know yeah, i yeah, hate yeah. when there's movies that we know are big movies in the community and people are like oh talk about it and i'm like i don't want to shit on a movie that i know you like yeah it's one of your <laughs> favorites you don't need to hear me like that's not fun for me to record and it's not fun for you to listen to but- yeah it's also <laughs> not fun to sit down and edit it you know it's like and to put and to promote it to put in so much work to be like hey Hey, guess what? You're gonna hate this episode. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not in our hearts. Like, we just don't do that. That's why we haven't talked about Hellraiser. But the greatest thing about in this podcast and the fact that we have kind of revisited these types of movies that we were like, yeah, a little lukewarm on when we first saw them. Yeah, is that I've gained such a newfound appreciation. I think it's because we've consumed so much more cinema that we would have if we were keeping ourselves in our little boxes. Oh yeah. Like if I could just watch Underworld every day for the rest of my life, <laughs> I do. would have been happy. <laughs> yeah, but Underworld just- every day except. <laughs> the mummy on your birthday <laughs> <laughs> maybe the mummy every day in underworld on my birthday <laughs> yeah no i i also like this movie a lot more this time around i think it's because i just didn't know what i was in for because you only ever see the bill paxton stuff you're like wow this movie's gonna be so great and uh, it's very good but it's not it's not everything you think it's gonna be based on just those images no it's not that action-packed one thing this movie is missing that maybe doesn't fit the intended tone that they were going for and i see why it's not there but i would have loved me a car chase but you do get a cowboy on a horse, though, riding into town trying to <laughs> trying to save the day for the final act. Yeah. You do get a horse. I do get a horse. Solid three out of four from the both of us. Closing out our sunglasses at night double feature. We'd love to hear what you think of Blade and Near Dark. I know these are huge favorites for some of you out there. You can hit us up on social media, wherever you want to find us. NOFS Podcast or at Nightmare on Film Street. The best place you could go, though, would be the Nightmare on Film Street Discord at nofspodcast.com slash discord there's no bullshit in there it's just a bunch of horror fans talking about shit they like and it's algorithm free yeah which i thoroughly enjoy (laughs) if you've been a fan of nightmare on film street for a while consider supporting the show uh, on patreon it's not just you know you leave us a a couple bucks a month and you get nothing in return though we have tons of bonus episodes and content and we have monthly watch parties and there's all kinds of fun community stuff there so check that out at patreon.com slash nightmare on film street yeah we've got hours of content here in the regular podcast feed if you've binged through all that and you need more there's a whole junkyard of which is maybe not how i should describe it but there is a treasure trove of extra podcast episodes waiting for you in the fiend club We'll be back again next Thursday, but until then, I'm John. I'm Kim. Stay Stay creepy. It appears you made it out alive, but we'll get you next time. Help us to grow the horde. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe. More terror can be found lurking on our website, nofspodcast.com. Until next time, stay creepy, fiends.